Hello, everyone. I am Michiko, and I am subbing. I'm the special guest, as was announced on Facebook, and I am subbing for Laura today. And today on Ask the Vet, we have Dr. Tully with us. Dr. Tully and I have worked at Lefebvre Booths for quite a few years now, so I'm excited to get to work with him in this virtual setting as well. And I heard a lot about this hat, this Christmas hat that you yes. have, and I'm very excited. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, uh, glad to see you, and uh, we wish uh, Laura a speedy recovery. And um, but uh, glad to have you, and uh, in this virtual setting. Uh, Michiko, uh, we don't have the Reese's peanut butter cups, but or the what uh, Airheads, Airheads, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we do have it's Christmas time, and we have pulled out the Christmas hat, and for the Christmas spirit, uh, kind of a a combination of the Christmas vacation hat that cousin Eddie has, and then also uh, we have the the lighted antlers for those who have been in attendance and the uh, Christmas uh, webinar for Ask the Vet. So uh, happy holidays, everyone. And uh, to you, uh, Michiko and uh, Brenda in the background. Wonderful. Well, we do have a question, a starter question that came in online. And Dr. Tully was able to review this question. So I am just going to give a brief summary for the listeners, um, just so that the person that asked the question doesn't think I'm leaving anything out. Dr. Tully has reviewed it. And so it looks like we have a 39 year old yellow naped Amazon that has been diagnosed by the primary veterinarian with a hernia. It does have a cloacal prolapse, but it can void. Uh, there is a mass in the body cavity. The needle, a needle biopsy has been recommended to rule out cancer, and the bird does have some, some labored breathing. The diet is varied. Uh, the owners tried to get it on pellets, but you know, if we know our bird friends, some of them can be quite picky. And uh, so the bird is on some seeds and pellets. And uh, depending on the diagnosis, uh, no treatment if cancer, possible treatment if the liver is enlarged, um, and possible hernia uh, treatment has been what was recommended. And age is a factor here as well, 39-year-old yellow naped Amazon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so... Um... Also, um, she mentions that the uh, the weight of the Amazon is is high, uh, which is not unusual for Amazons. Um, that is one of the um, just the general traits of an Amazon that it can get overweight, um, and they are subject to lipomas or fatty tumors. Um, but uh, the owner's trying to reduce the weight, which is good. Um, and the the bird is uh, has, uh, according to the owner, a uh, very good uh, personality disposition and uh, is uh, not uh, depressed or lethargic in any way. So acting what we would consider based on this uh, normal. Uh, a good appetite. Uh, well, we know that, uh, based on the weight. And, uh, so that's good that it's still maintaining the appetite and maintaining, uh, in energy, uh, but is, uh, exhibiting somewhat heavier or labored breathing while resting. And we've talked about that before birds that, uh, have labored or heavy, uh, uh or ha have difficulty breathing. You could always tell when they have their tail, if they are not having any difficulty breathing, it'll be straight. But if they're breathing, it'll move up and down. And we call that tail bobbing because every time they breathe, that's like, and I mentioned that it's like when we tail bob, after you run a long way 
or depending on if you don't run a lot, a short way, you bend over and you and your tail's bobbing. But the birds have the feathers and so they bob like that. And and so that's just where the bird doesn't have a diaphragm and it's using its its abdominal muscles and its muscles and its rib cage to expand and breathe, expand and breathe. If they don't have any difficulty breathing, they do that without any exertion. If they are having difficulty breathing, whether it's after they after they do uh, exercise or fly around or get excited and they just need air like after we run, then they will tail bob. Or if they have a disease condition, they will tail bob during the, the uh, because they, they their respiratory system isn't working as efficiently as if it was normal. Uh, so that's that's why where you could see you could get heavier or labored breathing. Um, and she also mentions I've tried to transition him to mostly a pellet diet without complete success. Well, welcome to the world there. Most people uh, in transitioning birds uh, from a pelleted diet, uh, a seed diet, uh, mainly a seed diet, to a pelleted diet uh, as a primary uh, diet, it's, it's, it can be difficult. And so uh, no, no uh, really, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to, uh, you know, say anything bad about that because it's, <clears throat> that is not unusual. Although I've had older Amazons that needed to get on a pelleted diet for health reasons or uh, weight issues or what have you, uh, transition uh, fairly easily. So it, it can happen where they do transition uh, easy. It may surprise you. It surprised me over time where one will go like, boom, where have these pellets been all my life? Um, but uh most of the time, people have the results you do where you don't have complete success. That's okay if you don't have complete success because, again, diversity, uh, you've heard me talk about it before, diversity in diets is something that I really recommend. Uh, it says, additionally, he prefers safflower and sunflower seeds. And then it has very limited. Well, it's just like me and pizza. I haven't met a pizza I didn't like, okay? Um, and so I don't know if I've ever seen a bird that met a sunflower seed that it didn't like, okay? So this is not this is not atypical. It is it is very chip, typical. It has parrot chop with various greens and vegetables. It, it's a great diet. Uh, you know, I can say fruits, seeds, blueberries, apples, pomegranate, walnuts, chia, flax seeds occasionally. Now that's that's good because often, you know, I always tell our students when you ask a question during a history, well, you know, the question is, is what do you feed your animal? What do you feed your bird? Okay. And so somebody tells so says all that. So if you don't go any more further into the question. Okay, well, um, Dr. Tully feeds his bird uh, a wonderful diet. I wish I had that diet. But the real question is, what? What does the bird eat? You can feed him a wonderful diet, but Dr. Tully, he only eats, a, you know, flax seeds, you know, but you feed them blueberries, apples, pomegranates, and seeds, you know, greens, vegetables, but he only eats the flax seeds. Yeah, I have to throw the rest away. So the real question is after what do you feed it? But the real question is what does the bird eat? Okay. And so if it only eats flax seeds and you feed them this every day, all it'll eat is the flax seeds. So you have to try to work 
and it'll it it will eventually it'll eat the flax seeds first, and then it'll eat possibly uh, a fruit or a vegetable next, and then a nut or what have you. But it'll go down the list on what it likes, no different than a human. You know, it's not like well, I don't really like that. I'm going to eat it first. Nobody does that. You got to eat what you you know. You know, too bad they don't bring out the dessert first. You probably eat the dessert first, right? I would. So keep that in mind. And uh, when you're feeding, if you feed this, you know, the food the every day, it's going to only eat what it wants and not anything else. And so you have to kind of work in that that manner. And so in the end, would you please offer your recommendations and analysis on how you would approach this situation as your as the current avian and exotic vet that is available to me is not certified but appears very capable? Okay, there's another thing. Certified. Well, what is certified? Well, the avian, if you if you want to say certified, you can say an avian specialist. Okay, now an avian specialist has had uh, intensive training or has gone through um, experience uh, that has been put forth and deemed acceptable by a group of uh, veterinarians uh, that oversee a college, a specialty college or a specialty board. And in this case, it's the American Board of Veterinary um, Practitioners in which you become an avian specialist. That's the only avian specialty um, out there, okay? And so, uh, you have concentrated training on birds and that's what you see, or you have experience in birds and you have passed all of these requirements. Now that takes time. Then you have to study for a little test. The little test that I took took three days. I don't think it's three days now because it had different parts and it was not all day, but what I was saying, it's two days now uh, you know, uh, too bad it's not three. I remember when it was three. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, it's it's a, a test, and if you pass the test, then you become a specialist and have to be recredentialed every ten years by continuing to learn. That's what a specialist is, and as you can see, it takes a lot of time and effort. Not everybody who has worked and has experience and has knowledge and is a good avian veterinarian is a specialist. So don't count or, or as I say, don't utilize that as the only means that uh, somebody is a good avian veterinarian because there are excellent avian veterinarians that can run circles around specialists that are not specialists. They have been working and training and their knowledge of the, 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 the birds is very good. So keep that in mind and, and, um, and don't always utilize the specialty criteria as the end all be all on a good avian veterinarian. And I say this with a number of colleagues in mind that I would take my bird to in a split second uh, if it had any issues. Um, but uh, the avian specialty does give you an idea that somebody has had that uh, intensive training and has gone through that process. So that is that is a uh, an excellent means also to uh, determine if uh, somebody's qualified uh, to work on the bird. But uh, if you have a great avian veterinarian and they're not a specialist, uh, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Just be happy you have a great avian veterinarian. Now, with that said, as I said, this question had a lot of components to it that I, I felt like uh, were uh, that needed a little bit of expansion and discussion on 
Um, and then we get back to this where uh, the bird has been diagnosed with a uh, hernia and uh, a hernia is where there's a, a, a tear in the abdominal muscle. And what's happened is that this tear in the abdominal muscle and the intestine is going through that under the skin, okay? And then as the skin is, is actually going uh, uh, under the, uh, is the intestine is going under the skin, uh, more of the intestine can come out and then uh, it, and this hernia can grow, okay? Now, <clears throat> the intestine being out of the body is not good, okay? It is not good at all. And so what, you know, what can happen over time, the bird can live, the intestine can, can function outside of the body cavity under the skin, but it also can, can get adhesions where the, the intestine can, can, can kind of weld itself together, okay? They called it adhesions. It could, it, it, it's like could stick together, okay? And so that, that becomes problematic. So the hernia is there. Uh, how do you say, well, how do hernias occur in birds? Just how they occur in people. Uh, straining can cause hernia. Um, uh, lifting weights can cause hernia. Uh, uh, egg laying in female or uh, hens can cause hernia. Uh, so this is all part of it that can, can cause a hernia. Now this is a tear in the abdominal muscle. Uh, if it's if it's uh, caught early, um, it's it's a relatively uh, easy surgery. Uh, uh, you can uh, get the intestines back into the body cavity, and then you can suture up that uh, uh, body wall and correct the hernia just like they do in humans. If it's longer and you have adhesions. Well, and more of the intestine is out of the bird, then it's more difficult because you cannot get to the, find the abdominal tear as easily because of all of these adhesions. And you can't, you can't tear apart the intestines from each other because it'll rip the intestines open. So it's a very delicate surgery. And uh, so you have to make sure that you don't don't um, really uh, disrupt those those adhesions uh, on the uh, the intestine. Uh, so um, this is uh, something that is uh, uh, with the hernia. Uh, and so then you go and you say, well, what is the the uh, you know, you can see the uh, bulbous egg-shaped growth protruding in the lower abdominal area. That's probably the intestines protruding from that uh, tear in the, uh, the, um, the abdominal musculature. And so they use uh, radiographs. They look at radiographically, they looked at that. And sometimes this is not as uh, diagnostic because they can't tell if it's just the the uh, abdomen, abdomen or salomic cavity uh, that's uh, protruding, uh, or if it is actually outside of the body. Uh, sometimes you can uh, see that, but to to verify it, ultrasound, which was done, uh, can can help validate those radiographs. Um, and so, um, that's what we are uh, looking at. And then um, all of the, the, the tests uh, are normal and then uh, uh, that it appears. And so it looks like the bird is, is uh, functioning with the hernia. However, the, the, the question is, is that there's a, a mass within the body cavity and a needle a biopsy has been recommended to determine if the mass is a tumor, uh, diseased uh, liver, or is it part of the hernia? Is it part of this, this mass of intestine uh, within the body 
uh, that is causing this. Now, there could be um, a, uh, uh, there could be uh, uh, a tumor. Uh, as it, they mentioned, uh, they, they need they want to do this needle biopsy uh, to determine if the mass is a tumor or not. And then that could be putting pressure on those intestines that's causing it to go outside of the body. And, and so that could be the reason. Now, is it liver related? Uh, it, it may be, but everything looks good on the the uh, the results of the the liver test um, on that, um, but sometimes cancer can uh, make uh, everything look normal or negative, and it's in fact what it is. Um, but to to get down to the to the uh, to find out what that mass is 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 um, the needle biopsy would be required. And with the ultrasound and with uh, the needle biopsy, that is relatively a uh, uh, easy procedure to do, and uh, one that would uh, very possibly provide an, an answer to what that mass is. Um, the, the the question you have a 39 year old Amazon. The question is is how long this hernia has been there. Uh, and so in its functioning, find out what the mass is. I would say that I would, I would concur with your, your veterinarian to get, you know, have the needle biopsy to find out. And the second is the hernia. How long has it been there? If it's, if it's a large hernia and, um, uh, and there's a lot of the intestine out and it's been there quite some time and the bird is doing well it may be good just to leave it um, because uh, you'd have adhesions. Uh, it would be a long surgery, long anesthesia, and difficult to break down those uh, adhesions. And uh, the likelihood of being successful to get down to the body, which is way down there uh, in a large hernia, uh, would, would be extremely difficult. And it would be... Um, uh, a really uh, risky surgical procedure if it's large and has been there quite some time based on experience. So yes, it was, it was uh, a single question, but it touched on a number of things that we haven't talked about before and that are kind of outside the realm of a hernia, uh, but it is uh, something that um, and many of these I thought were extremely important for our, our uh, attendees to, to uh, know about, and, and uh, it was a great opportunity to do so. So there you go. Thank you so much, Dr. Tully. I especially really appreciated your comments on, um, on veterinarians, and just because they're not specialists and they don't have those extra letters, they can still be excellent, excellent veterinarians. So thank you for Definitely. saying that. And yeah. I, I have, I have a, my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Richard New Orleans. I take my bird to him in a second. Oh yeah, Dr. Gregory. <laughs> And I have a friend that just became AB, ABVP, AVN certified. So he just told me it was two days, eight hours a day. <laughs> Oh, well, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell him. Uh -huh. um, and then, so we do have another question. Um, this question is from Ginny, and it is What is your position on bathing Congo African grays? I always thought it was good to mist twice a week, but some professionals say no, just provide ample clean water. I'm assuming in a dish to allow for the bird to make that choice. Oh, well, um, my, my thoughts, uh, on this is I, I pretty much, um, let the, let the birds decide. I don't, you know, uh, African grays, uh, the, the, I guess with African grays in, in general, um, 
I, I think what the um, some people are, are are talking about as far as just provide ample clean water um, in a container that the grays are um, familiar with and uh, knowledgeable of. And not you know uh, if it's a gray, I wouldn't uh, necessarily um, get a new uh, new container every time uh, because uh, uh, they. Uh, they don't like um, uh, new things, okay? Uh, for the most part, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that they do like <clears throat> new, but uh, that have found to, that for uh, is uh, kind of different than other birds. But but grays uh, <clears throat> have a tendency to be um, uh, skittish. Um, they they tend to. Uh, uh, in my experience, uh, not uh, uh, take to uh, newness or, or uh, um, things that are um, uh, unusual uh, easily. They like to kind of uh, get accommodated. Um, uh, they, they kind of get frightened, uh, kind of, you know, they kind of standoffish. Uh, so, I think what they're saying is put the bowl in there and let the gray do what it wants to do is that you're not, you're not getting in there misting it with a, a spray bottle like I do with my little Senegal and, uh, and, and getting in there and uh, spraying it in the, the gray. Like, hey, hey, hey. You know? Um, and so that's something that is kind of a, uh, not a happy thing time okay not a happy time for the little gray and so that that is kind of i guess delaying or stunting it's 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 ability your you know your 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 companionship uh quality uh, of the gray and uh in in the interaction is negative not a positive and so i think that that's that's what people are concerned about when they say oh well we have to you know just let the gray do it and, and and you know you just do good things happy things with it uh you know say oh you're gonna like this bottle you're gonna like this bottle you know uh and that's with any bird if the bird likes it i mean some birds will flare their wings and flap and they just enjoy it other birds don't you know don't make them enjoy it because you know you want to you want to, in some birds, you'll see, um, get in the, you know, you'll look at their feathers, say, I'll oh, look at my Senegal, it'll get at its water bowl. I have a Lixit bottle in there too, but it'll get at its water bowl and I'll see all of the, the feathers and, you know, it'll, it'll, you know, get around and, and, and do its own bath uh, over and above my misting it. So, <clears throat> Try to let the, the birds decide. You can miss it. You can see if they like it. If they don't, then 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 I wouldn't do it. So that's just kind of my my philosophy uh, on on the uh, uh, on the misting. <clears throat> in 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 grays, um, they do have a tendency, um, and it's a rare occurrence. But I've had African grays go into a mode where it, it it's almost like they they snap if it's a a, a bad uh, experience. Um, uh, one of the instances that that I remember is that uh, had a gray and the and the and the, the gentleman um, uh, had the bird and this is very rare but I've heard it from other veterinarians where this has occurred where the, the bird was very interactive and just a loving uh, uh, little little African gray. And then uh, African grays, you, if you trim the feathers, you don't wanna trim them too short uh, because grays have a tendency to, to have uh, uh, their keel. Um, and, 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 and really if they fall too far, they'll, they'll, they'll their keel will lacerate. They'll have a laceration right over the keel bone, just like it's all it's skin and like fighters uh, will will cut themselves right here because you just have skin and bone. So if you, if it gets hit, then it's it has a tendency to 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 cut, and so they'll get a cut here. So this little gray 
you know, fell and and cut itself. Uh, and and so uh, they took it to a veterinarian and did everything that a veterinarian does uh, to it. And uh, no, nothing abnormal. They uh, sutured it up, cleaned it, everything, and told the owner to give it the medication, um, you know, for uh, a period of time uh, to prevent an infection and took it home, took it home. <clears throat> and the first time that he went to give that medication, I don't know what, because the bird had been through all of this, no problem, everything the same, still getting his on, you know, everything. He went to give the medication. As soon as he, he went to, he gave them the, the medication, the bird just like, boom, just like, just, just, just went, went off. And the owner could never get next to that bird, never get next to that bird anymore. I mean, he brought it in. I, it was like, it was a different bird. And that was the, the, the story. And I've heard of, of that happening. So uh, that is why we try to, to do everything we can to, to make the experience. And if it's uh, uh, something where the bird uh, needs to have some type of a procedure, we try not to have the owner in the room uh, because the, um, the bird sees the owner, you know, like, this is happening and so that experience really it's the owners in with the the experience where you have to treat a fracture you know the bird may have a fracture or it has a laceration or you know it has to go under anesthesia or what have you an endoscopic procedure for a renal biopsy or something like that any type of medical issue it, it, the bird cannot rationalize, and and so we try to to separate. We're the bad guys, okay? Uh, trying to do good, uh, but we don't want the owner to to be that way. So that's what we try to do. So these type of things with grace, they they uh, so that may be where that's coming from with the spraying and just let the bird bathe on its own and. Uh, and, uh, but it's, it's uh, whatever the bird uh, enjoys or likes um, uh, is, is where, uh, and if it doesn't, don't press it, you know, on that. Um, but I, I have found where grays, they don't like new things in their cage. They don't like, like that. But if a gray, if you have a pair of grays and they're not laying eggs, move them. They like new environment. I guess it reproductively stimulates grays where it's not necessarily going to stimulate other, other birds, but it does stimulate grays. I don't know. It's like take them around for a ride, uh, move the cage into a different area, a different location. And for some reason, grays all of a sudden become reproductively active, and uh, which is a little bit different than a number of uh, different other citizen species that I've been around, uh, you know, I had, you know, somebody had, had a number of a pair of grays said, I'm getting rid of the grays. They're beautiful grays. Yeah, I'm getting rid of them. They're too much money. They're not laying any eggs or whatever. As soon as he sold them, they were all laying eggs. You know, that's just one, one experience, but it, 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 it's, uh, it, it's over and over again over the years that people have done that with African grays. So it's a little bit different, maybe, uh, it affects them reproductively, but nonetheless, there you go. That's funny. It's almost like they're on a little honeymoon. They went to, you know, an island on vacation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Oh, it's romantic. I, I mean, amorous, you know. Hey, look, we're in a new location, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so we do have another question from Adam, and this is a really interesting question. I'm excited to hear your answer. And um, so Adam wants to thank you for all your time as always. And he has a few questions in regard to lighting. Is there a specific distance 
and or direction or position that lighting is recommended to be from the bird or the bird's cage. Secondly, most full spectrum or high definition light bulbs come LED now. Do you have any advice on the amount of lumens that should be used to avoid eye issues or other stressors on birds? Thank you once again, and thank you Lefebvre for these webinars and experts, uh, the best thing ever to come from COVID. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Adam, and, and uh, we do our best. And and uh, like I said, for, for, the, for that question, I guess, uh, you know, and as we go through the half an hour, I was going to break off, break my, my off my cousin Eddie hat because it's been here since COVID, and we'll keep it. But I, I have a new one. I have a new one here, and it's uh, it, it's it's Santa, and so I have my cap here, and we're gonna we're gonna go with Santa here. Um, but as far as the um, as as far as the UVB uh and and the direction uh i don't think that we're going to be looking at any any specific um uh direction uh as far as the the light is concerned um it's it's uh ambient light within in the room now if you uh have full spectrum light that's a little bit uh different it's it's uh, of course gonna is going to spread but the, the light has to be at a distance that is uh, required by that product to be effective. And, uh, and usually it's, it's within the, the uh, I guess, uh, I would say you're, you're looking at, at one to two feet uh, as far as the distance from, from the, uh, the, the animal for that, that artificial UVB light to work, uh, but read the read the product uh, on that. Um, and and as far as the uh, so direction, uh, it's just the ambient light. It uh, the UVB. Most of the birds are in cages, but if you have a, a plexiglass cage or you have some type of a um, a cage with uh, a barrier uh, on it. Uh, it has to be direct. It can't go through glass, plexiglass, anything else. So cage bars, yes, that, that's fine because uh, uh, it, it, uh, the bird will uh, get the, uh, the lighting from there. Um, but um, glass, plexiglass, or any kind of barrier, that's not going to go around it. And if it goes through that, then it's, it's not going to be as effective or effective. That's the same way with these lights. You have to use the lights, as I've mentioned before, as um, as recommended for the time frame that that UVB is going to be emitted from that bulb. The bulb will light for years, but the UVB is only good for however long it says six months, a year, what have you. So. Just because it lights doesn't mean it's coming out. Um, it's going to only come out from the time purchase to the time it says on the uh, the bulb for uh, how long it's used. Now you talk most UVB at this point are LED. That's where we are in history. Um, as far as that goes, the the um, uh, is. There's a, there's uh, of course there's the the issue you, you mentioned as far as stress I as far as the the LED is concerned there is a, um, uh, a wavelength uh, of of light that comes out uh, with uh, LED or a, a, a flicker with that um, but. Um, I'm not aware uh, and not knowledgeable on what would be um, appropriate or not uh, for the birds. Um, uh, at this time, I'm not aware of anything that is causing significant problems or health issues. We are always finding out new things. And, uh, but 
uh, there may be something out there, um, but I'm not aware of it. Um, you can uh, definitely check to see if anybody has any, any recommendations and can report on that next time. But I'm not aware of any at this point. Thank you so much for your insight on lighting. I know that there's still a lot of work being done on studying lighting effects in multiple species. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, our next question. Uh, I, was gonna, I was gonna add, uh, Michiko, yes, we've done some studies and I think I've mentioned it. Uh, you know, uh, I'm just kind of writing down. So I'll I'll have that next time. Oh. Although I won't have my Santa hat on next time, but I'll have my 2024 hat on now. But oh. uh, uh, but we've done some where we found that uh, there is a, a reduction in the vitamin D levels uh, with the birds that are outside versus birds inside uh, over time. Um, and that uh, it's not to say that the birds inside uh, have uh, uh, any, any adverse health issues that are related to it, but um, at the same time, it does show that, that there is uh, some effect uh, with birds getting natural light versus uh, no UVB uh, light as it relates to vitamin D. Um, but it, it, it doesn't like, oh my, you know, it, you know, birds have lived, uh, many years inside without ever having, uh, uh, natural light and have lived, uh, well past their, their average lifespan that way. So it's not to say, uh, well, I, I have, I don't have UV, I need to get a UVB. Um, yeah, uh, that's that it's just like taking vitamins. How many people take vitamins? How are you doing? Probably doing well, but you know, you take vitamins, does that help? Well, it may, you know, this person may get COVID, this person may not, is it the vitamins? I don't know, but it's just trying to provide as much information if you can to, to, to give your, your bird or yourself the best chance to be as healthy as possible, you know? Great insight. Love it. Well, we're, right. and we're still learning. Oh, so, oh my goodness. Yes. That's great so questions, true. by the way, as always. And I, I, I tell you, we have some great bird owners out there and great attendees to the webinar. And, uh, and I want to thank them. Yeah, very much so. Santa, oh, thank you. you. <laughs> um, Kate P., says, what do you think of having two parrots so they have the benefit of socializing? Should they be the same species? If so, do you think Congo and Timne are close enough in social culture to be a good pair, or would it be better for them to be with the same exact species? Are there sex combinations that you would suggest? And then so interestingly, uh, she says, in Germany, it is required wired to keep parrots in pairs uh with some exceptions i didn't know that that's really interesting that is interesting that yeah. is interesting because um that's like uh some aliens coming down here and saying oh well we want you together and we want you together <laughs> and live in the same room huh how about that hopefully you like each other right <laughs> and so that's my thoughts. Uh, just like arranged marriages for two pairs of birds and wonder why they're not reproducing, right? Um, we're just lucky that uh, we do. Uh, we're as successful as possible um, and talked about that. Uh, I've always said, if you are looking for a bird for companionship purposes, um, uh, that you um uh a single bird is going to be your best bet um or maintaining the birds in a single cage uh i think anybody with birds will know that if you have multiple birds there's going to be birds that uh just like animals they're going to want your attention 
right? They're going to want your attention and they're going to do everything they, they can to get it undivided attention from you. I don't care about that Moluccan cockatoo over there. I'm the African gray. I want all the attention. And the Moluccan cockatoo is going to say, if you don't give me attention, I'm going to scream until your head pops off, right? So it's, it's one of those things. It's a great question. Uh, I don't know in Germany if they require you to put the two birds in a cage together, but that would be business for the veterinarians to um, possibly uh, increase the business of veterinarians to um, for trauma that occurs when two birds don't really like each other. Um, and, uh, and it's not to say I have two budgies in a, in a, uh, or three budgies, I'll put those in, but I can definitely, there's something called the pecking order. And I don't know if anybody knows where that term comes from, the pecking order, but that means that you have a bird up here or a person up here and you have all the little peeps below. And you know how they get to the top? By pecking the back of their head and until it succumbs, okay? And so, um, it is pretty, pretty um, uh, vicious uh, what birds do to each other to develop a pecking order within a hierarchy. And within a cage, if you have two birds, there is a pecking order. There is a top bird and a lower bird. And some birds, they uh, uh, within a group of birds, they'll ha even have hormonal effects where uh, some of the birds, um, uh, gonads uh, will be uh, larger than others within that group of birds. Um, but uh, with that said, it kind of puts us back into uh, putting two birds together in a cage. One, if you want to have the birds and enjoy each other and, you know, and they're together, then um, I would say that, uh, that they would be more, uh, amenable to each other for the most part, if they get along, then yourself. So it kind of would be kind of getting away from that companionship. If you say, well, that's why I want them because I'm not there a lot. Um, well, then uh, you would, um, uh, yeah, the, the closer that they, you know, it would be the same species uh, within the, the, uh, the the cage and uh, and and I and I can tell you that people probably have uh, good stories uh, about putting birds together and people will have horror stories about putting birds together. So um, there's not something that'll say yes, this will do it and this is you know do it and this will happen. I just uh, I think it's better if the birds are separated unless you have them in a breeding situation, you have a male and a female. And even in male and female cases, a collectives and, a, and cockatoos, they'll kill each other. Um, and so um, uh, it, it, it is with um, extreme caution that you do that. Um, uh, for uh, larger birds, uh, larger parrots, such as grays. Um, and, and if you do get two birds, uh, I would, I would recommend separate cages, um, uh, personally, uh, to prevent injury because I've treated so many, uh, injuries, uh, not only injuries where the birds were in the cage, but where the bird goes over and tries to visit and uh, the visit doesn't turn out well. And then they don't turn out well this time, and the next time they do it, it doesn't turn out well either. <laughs> they don't learn. So it's a great question. It's a great question, but you put two birds together, um, they'll, and, and they uh, are amenable, then they will, they will uh, have a tendency to say, well, we're, we're alike, we like each other, but this other person out there, mm, uh, I don't, well, we're just gonna do what we wanna do. Um, you separate the birds in different cage, in two cages, uh, then you have a, a little bit better. They could be in the same room, uh, but that's, that's what I would, I would recommend uh, more than 
putting them together in the same cage. But great question. And I'm sure that there's uh, uh, just like anything else, there's a lot of different opinions. And uh, but like I said, it's it's there's going to be people say, oh, I have had great success and and the birds love each other and, and do all of this. And this is how it happens. And then you have others that's, you know, like I said, have tragedies uh, that that has occurred. And so uh, I don't like tragedies. And so I try to be a little bit more conservative on that front but uh, recognize that people have uh, different opinions and it's worked out different ways for people. Great question. Yeah, it definitely was a great question and great answer as well. Thank you, as always. Um, so our next question is from Frank and it is, do small parrots like cockatiels and conures carry bacteria that can only impact large parrots or is this internet rubbish? Thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I'll i say I, I, I like that um, internet rubbish. I'm one to encourage all of, all of uh, the, the bird owners that I treat their birds. I encourage all bird owners to be as informed as possible. Uh, that's why I commend everybody here that uh, we get a chance to discuss um, uh, different uh, things and learn from each other. Um, and, 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 and what you find out is that there's uh, uh, that, that often there's not a, a uh, <clears throat> set in stone answer. Um, and, and and with that, and, and uh, we have the uh, the great uh, the technology today to to at our fingertips, literally, uh, to find out about different things and and learn uh, what we can from from many different resources on the on the internet. Um, and and but I always tell them, I, you know, be informed. Look what you can. Uh, but if you have any questions uh, before you implement anything or you have a, a, a question such as this, uh, call me, you know, email me. Uh, so so uh, that's great. Now, you say cockatiels and what? What else? Cockatiels and... So it was, do small parrots like cockatiels and conures carry conures. bacteria that impact larger birds? It, you know, only, only impact larger birds. Well, um, none that I'm aware of, none that I'm aware of, because the bacteria, um, and, and it's, it's kind of like um, typhoid berry. And of course, on this Astavet, we go all over the place, don't we? I mean, it's just like, where in the world are we coming up with Typhoid Mary? So that was uh, back in the last century. There was a, a, a woman who was an, uh, what they call an asymptomatic carrier and go around and infect people. But she had the, the, uh, the, uh, the disease, but it didn't affect her. And so, so that's the situation with a lot of uh well with a, a number of disease conditions um where some uh the birds will have the the organism but not show signs of the disease and can spread the organism uh you know and, and expose other birds okay they can uh, the organism can get on the clothes and then somebody can go and they say oh and go visit some other aviary and then oh look at your little babies you know and put the the baby birds here um and then expose those birds to the the organism and those birds get infected and ill right so uh all you know for the most part there, you know, these, you know, cockatiels, and probably while they were talking about cockatiels in general, there's a couple, um, uh, chlamydia cytosi or cytokosis. It's a inner cell. It's an intracellular bacteria. It's in the cell, and so um, 
cockatiels could be uh, subclinical. Birds don't have symptoms. Animals don't have symptoms. They, they only have clinical signs. So there's no clinical signs, okay, um, of disease. And then what happens is that the, uh, uh, the bird uh, starts shedding. It, it, gets, it gets stressed or what have you and starts shedding. And so if, there, if this, this bird is not, um, uh, and so if, uh, if this, this uh, owner uh, has other, other birds, then they may uh, uh, become ill from it, where this bird may recover. This bird may die from it. Uh, cockatiels die from it. So all of the diseases, and there was uh, there was a, a, a disease back in the 80s, 90s uh, that we had more prevalent. It's not gone away, uh, but we just don't have the importation. We just don't have as many uh, uh, birds that uh, are coming in that uh, may have the 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 virus. It was uh, a herpes virus. It was called Pacheco's disease. And Pacheco's disease was a, uh, or is uh, a disease that Patagonian Conyers, it was Patagonian Conyers. They, they are, uh, uh, those are the ones that are disseminating the disease. Well, there were many Patagonian Conyers uh, being imported at the time. And, but Pacheco's is a herpes virus that affects other birds. Other birds can have it. It's a herpes virus. It could be subclinical, and then the birds get the uh, the the you know shed the disease uh, or the organism, and other birds get the the disease. So, no, there's no single or you know or bacterial organisms that or uh, you know viral organisms that. Uh, cockatiels or conures can get to give to older birds that it wouldn't affect the cockatiel or conure. But there's many disease processes that are caused by bacteria and, uh, and viruses uh, in, in all animals, including humans like typhoid berry, where you have somebody like, oh, I'm fine, you know? And, but shedding the bacteria or the virus and infecting other people. So, um, uh, you know, this is something to be, and that's why we have quarantine. That's why we have quarantine. And, and, uh, and, and because you want to have the birds quarantined and look to see during that 30 days that you have them outside of any, any exposure to any other birds in the house, if they have any, they develop any clinical signs of disease. So uh, that, that you can pick that up. That's why you have your, your exams. That's why you do um, the, uh, the, the, the complete blood count to look to see if there's any inflammation that's going on. I had a, I had a little green cheek conure. I haven't seen a, a bird with uh, 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 chlamydia or psittacosis and, and uh, for that's a human form, maybe chlamydiosis is a, the, the, uh, uh, the bird form, but I haven't seen avian chlamydiosis in, 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 in a number of years. And this bird came in just, you know, physical exam and part of the physical exam, like I said, I can see what's going on outside. The bird looked look good you know it may have been a little you know it could have been uh not as active but it was nonetheless uh active uh but um we took the uh uh the blood count which we is part of the physical exam and you know just looking at the bird and say oh okay yeah, yeah okay doing good it's just a a new bird, and it'll get used to the surroundings. The normal white blood cell count is 15,000. This bird had a 55,000 white blood cell count. Yeah, that's how you pick these things up. Uh, and I mean, it's not uh, for everything, but that's how you you go through and you can you can identify some of these these birds that that may be ill or 
that are not showing signs. And um, I can give you a number of examples of that, but that's why the, the blood work is so important. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the answer is no, but it does open that whole uh, area to uh, subclinical carriers of disease and that all birds are suspect just like all humans are suspect of uh, you know, having diseases uh, that you don't see, but it can be, uh, you can be exposed to, you know? So, um, because the bacteria and viruses, like I say, uh, in the, well, the commercial has said it, it doesn't care, shingles don't care. Well, bacteria and viruses don't care and they work 24 seven, 365. So uh, that's what we uh, do to try to reduce exposure and identify it and treat appropriately. There you go. Thank you so much, Dr. Tully, for your, all your time today and answering all of our questions. Um, we are out of time today, but we do have a winner for today. And the winner today is Ron Brown, and he wins the holiday bundle of Lefebvre products. And we have a short video to show it's less than a minute, so please stick around. Um, we do have a couple more announcements. The holiday webinar is on Wednesday, December 20th. Uh, Laura will be back for that, but I will be on as well, helping out. And it does start early at 11 a.m. Pacific time. You have to be there for a chance to win one of over $3,000 in prizes. And, um, and we're going to be on a break in January. So our 2024 season begins back on February 2nd. And then we have a brand new series starting February 9th. Um, for IAABC members who view live today, the webinar is approved by IAABC for one uh, continuing education unit. You'll want to contact Lisa Bono at the platinum parrot at gmail.com after the webinar. And then we have a little video to show really quick regarding all the prizes. So let me share that very quickly with you. Can you see that, Dr. Tully? Yes, I can. It okay. looks Christmassy and it's starting. Okay, starting. Yes. Uh. All right. Well, that's another video that I will not play for everyone. Um, well, but I, hope it, I hope that that ended up well, because it looked like there was a fire in the pit. Oh, no. <laughs> I hope so, too. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Dr. Tully. Well, we thank you so much, Michiko. Oh. And I want to wish everybody out there a wonderful, Christmas, a Merry Christmas, and a happy and healthy 2024 for you, your family, and all of your, your feathered friends and loved ones out there, because uh, uh, it's been a great 2023, and uh, look forward to uh, uh, seeing you in 2024 with uh, some great questions, and uh, again, wish you a uh, a uh, very, very Merry Christmas and a uh, Happy New Year. Thank you so much. There's a lot of wishes coming for you and all of us as well in the chat, just so you know that sentiment yeah. returned. And so, holidays for everyone. There's a lot <laughs> of holidays in, in December. So, yeah. 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 Okay. See ya. Right. Bye bye. bye. Thank you.